So we're going to tag team this tonight. <laughs> so you're going to get both of us tonight. So just to hop in with us, let's have some fun. Let's, uh, we'll share a little bit about what we're going to do, and then we'll minister the word as well and then see what the Holy Spirit wants to do. But um, I guess we want to make it a little interactive as we start. Everybody's up for a little bit of interaction? <laughs> Okay. So, uh, pastors asked us if we would share what was on our heart. So, uh, as you all know, missions is a huge, huge part of my life. It's what I do every day, and so now this is what Travis does every day. <laughs> um, and so, um, guilty by association. Uh, so, we have a little fun uh, missional quiz that we'd like to uh, have you guys participate in. So we've got a couple of slides that we're gonna show you. So it's three questions. So I want y'all to read the first question, think about it, and then the second and the third, and then we'll reveal the answers, okay? So um, we have those first slide, please. Okay, um, we have Spanish-speaking friends. So at the top is Spanish and at the bottom is in English. So the first question is, Missionaries working in the unreached world. How many, or what percentage of missionaries go to the unreached? Those that have no gospel access. Is it 52%, 3%, or 27%? Okay, so think about it. That would, might be the answer. It might be next. So you're, you're thinking it. about the it? The answer is next. Skip it. And so <laughs> uh, we'll go to question number two. I told you, I told you. <laughs> okay, so. All right, so. Uh, all right, so um, 3% was the answer there, guys. Um, very, very small number. Did anybody get that right? All right, okay, good, okay. good. Okay, let's go to the next one. How many languages remain without a Bible? 750, 5,500, or 2,200? Twenty-two hundred. They twenty-two hundred languages are without a Bible, and of those languages, hundreds of thousands of people are represented there. So they there's an ongoing work, but but it needs to come up um, to impact the world. We need the Word of God in every language in every mother tongue. Okay, let's go to the next one. What percent of Christian giving is directed to missions? 0.1%, 10%, or 3%? 0.1. It's very small. So of missions giving, dollars go to missions giving, but to the unreached, pennies on the dollar go to the unreached. And it's mostly because people are not aware. The church at large is just not aware of the rest of the world that needs to hear the gospel. Yeah, so we hope after tonight all of us will be aware of the need to get the Word of God over to where we're going, and you can understand it more. So we're setting you guys up to be mobilizers, <laughs> to share what you're learning with other people, with, with believers, with the people you work with, the people you know, that there's a whole other world out there that still needs to hear, and people still need to go. So that's the end of our quiz. So uh, you guys did awesome. Thank you, you for anybody get a, Anybody get 100? All right. Couple. Okay. Got 100. Okay. All right. Good job. Praise God. All right. So the next slides are going to be um, a little bit more about kind of what we're doing in Lebanon. So yeah. So a little bit about us. So so our ministry that the Lord had us found was is the Way Commission. Back at the beginning of 2020, He put it in our heart. We did that because we knew there was a transition coming. The Lord began to talk to us about it, about going overseas, going internationally to go and teach, train, and equip. During COVID. During COVID. <laughs> <laughs> he knew what he was doing, praise yes. God. But, uh, and so our heart with this is, is, like Annie was saying, to help mobilize the local church to bring in awareness, but then also to help mobilize trained men and women to go and to take the gospel to those who, who need it. Mm -hmm. And then also to reach the unreached. So next slide. So we're, this is what we're doing. So you already know we're going to Lebanon. That's where we're headed. But so Lebanon will be based in Beirut, Lebanon. I know the text up there is a little small, but so Lebanon. So Africa is right underneath there for your, for your reference. So there's, there's North Africa, and then there's the Middle East, and then there's Europe right up above that. So Lebanon is right in between Israel and Syria. 
just so if, if you didn't know that, that's where it's located. And so there we'll be setting up a ministry base. We'll be joining a team. But from there will be our base. And the heart of it is what we'll be doing is we'll be training and equipping indigenous leaders, native leaders, to go forth and to go start church planting movements, establish Bible schools, mm -hmm. and to get the gospel into the 22 countries mm -hmm. that are in that region. And we'll be mobilizing uh, missionaries, like culture missionaries from that region, and we'll be training them and equipping them to reach the Muslim cultures in North Africa and the Middle East. And so we'll be helping to mobilize and helping to get the gospel out to the unreached, to that you know 3%. And hopefully we'll be bringing some teams here. Yes, yes. From from here. That would be awesome. <laughs> that would be Please awesome. I'm, I have to put that plug in. Okay. Talk to Daniel. Talk to Daniel. Okay. <laughs> but uh, but that's one thing. We'll also be helping bring teams into the country for short term mission trips as well. So. But uh, okay. Okay. Next slide. So just to give everybody a little bit of an idea, this is is the the MENA region. It's the Middle East, North Africa region. And there's, I've got the 22, uh, we've got the 22 target nations. Those are the nations that currently 90% of the people have never even heard the gospel. Mm -hmm. Just to give you a statistic, and Annie already hit on the, 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 the 1% there, the resources given. But So Lebanon, you can see it right there in the middle, the little flag that's got the green cedar tree. Um, that's where we'll be based, and then we'll... The heart of it, the vision, will be to, to get a church and Bible school throughout all these nations. H hundreds of churches, dozens of Bible schools, but really to get the gospel, because the gospel is what changes everything, amen? amen. When they can hear the truth of who Jesus is and what he's done for them. Okay, okay. next slide. Oh, you want to talk on this one? So uh, the picture of, of the Middle East and North Africa is the, called the 1040 window. And that term was coined by a missiologist. That's an invisible box. And you see that located in there, 95% of the unreached people groups live within that region. So that's 3 billion people who have never, ever heard the name of Jesus. And no one is going to many of those countries. They're unreached and unengaged. And so they won't have a chance to hear the gospel unless someone goes to them. And so we have our major religions in that 1040 window. So you can think about it with the acronym, the thumb. So we have the tribals, we have the Hindus, we have the unreligious, the Muslims, and the Buddhists. Those are the world's most dominant religions, and they all are in the 1040 window. And so the Bible says to go and to preach the gospel to every nation. All nations is ethne, and then the end will come. And so all nations means every people group, every culture. And so less than 3% of cross-cultural missionary forces go to the unreached. Most of the missionaries are going to the reached world because that's, it's easier. They have more establishment there. But now I think that it's a priority to turn our attention and our focus to the unreached into the heart of the 1040 window. That's where the gospel began in Israel. And so from that place, the gospel went out, but now we're, we're, we're going back there again. And that's where the need is. That's where the priorities should be. So that's where we're headed. Um, okay, the next one. You want to explain that one? Yeah, so this just kind of expands a little bit on what Annie just said. That currently, I think there's over how many, nine billion, over 9 billion people? 8 billion. 8 billion, eight billion people. Mm -hmm. But 3 billion or a third of the world they're unreached. And so in this area, there's one missionary roughly per 216,000 people. So you can see mm -hmm. Jesus said the laborers are few. <laughs> the harvest is great. The laborers are few. Pray to the Lord of the harvest that he would thrust Send forth laborers, laborers into the harvest. Um, uh, okay. Next slide. Okay, this is a really, really amazing thing to think about. But it says this. The 3.5 billion unreached people on earth would form a single file line that would stretch around the equator 25 times. Can you picture 25 lines of Christless people trampling endlessly toward hell? Let that vision stay with you day and night. Isn't that amazing to think about? 
And, and so we hope tonight what we can portray will open our eyes and we'll get a heart for the people of this region and how they need the gospel. And then we'll get motivated, we'll get inspired to find our part and do whatever we're called to do to, to reach these people. Um, next slide. Let's see. So, so what, this is the reason. So why are we even going to Lebanon? <laughs> so this is the reason. It's because of people. It's because of souls. And there's a huge harvest of people, as we've just mentioned, that's, that's waiting on someone, that's waiting on the gospel. But just, I like statistics since, you know, I did engineering and stuff. But here in the U.S., we have 333 million people. The Middle East, North Africa region where we're going, there's 500 million people. So imagine the entire U.S. and 99% of us are not born again. And then add 167 million people that are not born again as well. And we know the time is short and it's coming to a close. And we're wrapping up this dispensation, wrapping up this generation. And it's time for them to hear. We're responsible for this generation. This generation, this harvest, this, all nations. It's time for us to get to work. <laughs> Amen. Um, but so, what, uh, so with that, though, of that region, 99% are without Christ, and they're considered unreached because there's not enough followers of Jesus to minister to their Less own than people. 2%. And so, uh, followers of Jesus make a group of unreached people group, but in this area, it's less than half a percent. And so, what makes Lebanon such a strategic location is, is that you can freely train people, you can freely preach the gospel without any state-sponsored persecution. Mm -hmm. So it makes it an ideal place, right there in the heart of the region, to be able to bring in native leaders and train them and equip them and mm -hmm. send them out. Mm -hmm. okay. But, uh, but just here's a picture of us when we were in Lebanon. Uh, so this a taxi is, driver. Yeah. Uh, and uh, you can see I'm photobombing back there. Um, but uh, I was sitting up in the front with the baby. There's no car seats yeah, in Lebanon. Yeah. You just throw her in the car and go. <laughs> but, but we talked about life. We talked about Jesus. And we gave her um, an audio Bible in Arabic and in French. And she was so happy to receive it. Uh, and we kind of directed her towards uh, the ministry there and for, for follow-up. And, I, and I'll just add this plug in. Even the Airbnb that we stayed in, we had Syrian refugees delivering our groceries mm -hmm. that you can just minister to them, give them Bibles, talk to them. Mm -hmm. There's such a wide and door. they're really receptive. Yeah. So mm -hmm. I think okay. there... Uh, there might be a couple more. Okay. So, so here's a couple pictures just to, to give you an idea of what Beirut, Lebanon looks like. Um, we actually, that picture in the middle, we actually took that one. <laughs> our taxi driver let us stop and take some pictures of the... Beautiful sunset there. But there's um, what is there five over there's five million five million people in Lebanon. Um, that gives you an idea. That's the city there, Beirut. And then next slide. And then that's that's, that's one of their the main. Mosque there in the middle of the city. And then of course other pictures of the city. So that's that's where we're gonna be, guys. So just to give you a taste, that, just and that's to where see, you're gonna see. be too. You know, you're going with us. You all are Amen. going with us. So that means a lot. So I think all that right. was it, I think right? That's all of our slides there. Okay. Well, thank you guys for, for being interactive and joining us. <laughs> yeah. So let's um, let's pray, and um, we're going to share some things. And so, Father God, we just pray. We thank you for tonight. Thank you for this opportunity. Thank you for us being here together to hear the word of God, to be together, to, to hear the heart of God. Your heart, your heart beats people, your heart beats for them. You, you love them, you know them, even in their mother's womb, you had a plan for them. And so Father, we pray that tonight, the, the, the words that, that we share, that you've put in our hearts, I pray for an open door of utterance. I pray, Father, that you would think through our minds, speak through our lips. I thank you for opening uh, up our hearts to receive and Jesus, you, you, you are the Lord of the harvest. 
And Holy Spirit, you are the helper. You are the one who lives in us and the love of God that's shed abroad in our heart. So let us be moved with compassion the way you were moved with compassion. Help us to leave change tonight by the word of God, but by the spirit of God, uh, uh, confirming the word of God, demonstrating it, working it in our heart, the incorruptible seed that changes, that never fails. And we thank you for the door of utterance tonight. Thank you for just leading us and guiding us. And I just pray, we pray, thank you. Thank you for everyone getting your heart tonight. Thank you for revealing things individually to us, showing us things, how we can be involved with your work, with your kingdom, building the kingdom of God in this time. And we thank you for it in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. All right. Oh, hallelujah. So do you want me to start it up or... Okay, well, so so we're so we're going to Lebanon, and so we've to, to get here. We've been praying about this the last three, four years, really knowing there's a transition coming, and so we spent time praying, and the Lord's been positioning us to to get us to this point. And so with that, though, as we go, we see ourselves. You're going with us, but we're going, we're going to to like the, they went out, and Jesus said let down the net, launch out for a catch, a large drought to catch. And so we see there's a large catch. Amen. There's a large amount of fish that are ready to be caught. (laughs) And Jesus said, if you follow me, I'll make you a fisher of men. And so, but with that, when they caught that large drought, the partners got involved. Every one of us are involved in this great commission. Every one of us has our part to play. And the big picture, and we're going to hit on that, but also we're going to dig down into the individual assignments that each and every one of us have to fulfill for the Lord. Amen. Amen. And so we're going to call this, I'm going to call this, <laughs> I'm going to call it on, on assignment for eternity. Amen. I'm going to call it <laughs> identifying with Christ's mission. And when we, when we identify with Christ's mission, we'll, we'll find our mission. Yeah. Because it all wraps up into him. Right. Amen. Yeah. It's for the purpose of building the kingdom, growing the kingdom, affecting lives, transforming lives. Amen. Mm-hmm. And so it all comes together. When we do our part individually, each joint given our supply, then the body increases, the body grows. And when that happens, the kingdom of God advances. Amen. Yeah. And, uh, so we all have a role. Each of us has a role in the Great Commission. And so, I don't know if you guys ever heard of Barna, but they're, they do research and collect data for churches. And so, Barna put out a poll a few years ago, and they were asking churchgoers what the Great Commission is. And do you know, 51%, over half of the church had no idea what the Great Commission was. They said they never heard of it, didn't know. 25% said, yes, they've heard of it, but they weren't, they weren't exactly sure what it meant. says, yes, I know what it means, and I've heard of it. So 6% said they had no idea. So that tells me that overall, at large, the church, if they don't understand the Great Commission, then most likely they're not engaging. They're not participating in it. They haven't found their role. And no matter how many statistics we see, you know, they can be sobering, but really lasting and productive fruit and and the drive to want to do something about it doesn't last with statistics. It lasts with knowing Jesus, identifying with what his call was and finding our call in that. And so God, he needs flesh to complete this. You know, the, the gospel was for us, for the sons and the daughters. We have the privilege, not angels, not anybody else. And this is the only time that we have to do it. You know, we can't take anything with us to heaven except for souls. That's it. You know, Jesus gave his life. He laid his life down as a seed so that a harvest could come up. And we're responsible for putting the harvest into God's hands. He gave us that commission. We are co-laborers with Christ. So that means we all have a part to play. And not everybody is called to go to the Middle East, North Africa, but there is a part for you to play wherever you're mobilized. You know, the nations are coming here. And 70% of people from the nations, they've never been invited to an American home. 
they did a poll and they hadn't known about Jesus since they've been here and no one invited them or showed them hospitality. So the church needs to step up. They need to start reaching out to the harvest that's around them. You know, all around us, there are lost people, but they're not unreached. You can reach them, you know, but there in the Middle East, in the 1040 window, people are lost and unreached. There's no church around the corner that they could go to if they wanted to. You know, so there's a difference between the lost and the unreached. But we all have a part, and you can reach those. And so I want you all to start thinking about, you know, who you can reach, you know, what you can do, and asking God what your part is. And it also comes with discipleship and getting to know him. And so uh, one part I want to share is um, when Jesus was talking to his disciples, and he told them, he said, all authority of heaven and earth has been given to me. Therefore, go and make disciples of all nations, all nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit, teaching them to obey everything I've commanded you. And surely I'm with you to the end of the age. Now, some people say that, you know, miracles have done, been done away with with the apostles. We don't need to be involved with other people and other nations. But Jesus said, I will be with you to the end of the age. So we're still in the church age. Yes. We still have work to do. And God said, Jesus said, I'll be with you. I will be with you. And so he means for us to take the good news to this generation, to reach out and touch those that we can touch. All we have is our obedience, and all we can give is souls. And so God is ascending God. And Jesus, he sent, remember when he sent the 70 out? And he, you know, he was telling them, you know, don't be, don't be happy or surprised that, you know, the demons tremble, but that your name is written in the Lamb's Book of Life. That was identity. He was putting them over in identity, you know, at the end. This, all that's going to matter is eternity. The only thing that really matters is eternity. Okay. And people, like Travis was saying, God's heartbeat is for people. And when we get into his word and we, we fellowship with the spirit, we can hear we begin to hear, we begin to see that global thread from Genesis to Revelation of God sending, sending. And so we need to say, here I am, Lord, send me. We're disciples. All, every single one of us are disciples and we have a part. And to be a disciple, we have to continue in the word. That's what Jesus said. If you want to be my disciple, you have to continue in the word. Do what I've commanded you to do. But he also said, you have to take up your cross and follow me. And what is our cross? It's God's will for our lives. And for every one of us, God's will for our lives is, is this. It's this great commission. It's going, to be, it's going to look a little different for every one of us, but that is the bigger picture. And so we were all baptized with the Holy Spirit. Why? So that we could be witnesses, so that God could reveal through his word the, the, the finer details of each one of our lives. But really... The bigger picture is people, eternity. And so I'll let you jump off there. Oh. What's good? Yeah. It's good she's using my scripture. So that's, that's good. We're on the same page here. That's good. But, um, so everyone said, I'm on assignment. I'm on assignment. Amen. God's always been on assignment. Amen. And she's mentioning this from, he's been ascending God from Genesis to now. Remember in the garden, he started talking about the Redeemer coming. Amen. He put Moses on, on mission, Abraham on a mission. He's always on mission. And so we're on mission today. Amen. Jesus, he was on assignment when he came. Amen. When he finished, he said, it is finished. Pray, I'm glad he finished. Amen. Amen. And then he sat down and he passed us the baton and said, okay, now it's your turn. Mm -hmm. You take it and now you're on assignment. But let's, let's look at a couple of scriptures here. Um, I like this one. She's already hit on the Great Commission, Matthew 28 and Mark 16. He said also, go into all the world in Mark 16 and preach the gospel Amen. to Amen. every creature. Amen. She already hit Matthew 28. But Jesus said this in John 20, verse 21. He said, as the Father sent me, so I am sending you. Amen. Amen. Everybody say, I'm sent. Okay, so he's sending us. We're his ambassadors. We're his co-laborers together with him, and we're working as his fellow workers. And so let's look at this. Since we're talking about this, he's entered us in to this assignment. A familiar verse. We call it the, the, the race of life, right? The Bible says he set a race before us. Is everyone running? Amen. We're not walking. We're definitely not crawling, right? We're running together. 
Amen. It labors with him. But Hebrews chapter 12, we'll kind of jump into this. Hebrews chapter 12, verse 1. I'm going to read out the New Living Translation. It says, Therefore, since we are surrounded by such a huge crowd of witnesses to the life of faith, let us strip off every weight that slows us down, especially the sin that so easily trips us up. And let us run. Everybody say run. Run, run with endurance the race, <clears throat> excuse me, <clears throat> the race that God has set before us. Notice we're not on the sidelines. We're on the field. We're on the court. And it's the race that he has set before us. Amen. We don't get to choose it. Amen. <laughs> in your mother's womb, yeah. he put a race in there. We just get to discover it. Amen. And then we get to walk it out. We get to run and we get to fulfill it. Amen. Amen. And so why are we running? What's the finish line? You should know this. <clears throat> the finish line is when we stand before Jesus at the judgment seat of Christ. Amen. Amen. And so we're running for a prize. And that's in, <clears throat> yeah, can you get me some water, please? No, thank you, sweetie. My better half here. <clears throat> okay, 1 Corinthians chapter 9, verse 23 through 26. Paul saying this, I do everything to spread the good news and share in its blessings. That sounds like what he said in Romans chapter 1. I'm a servant of Christ. From my mother's womb, I was called to be an apostle, to preach the gospel. I do everything to spread the good news and share in his blessings. Don't you realize that in a race, everyone wins, but only one person gets the prize. So run to win. Right? We're not losers in here. We're, we're winners, and we're running to win. And the thing is, is we only have one race. One race while we're here on the earth. So let us run with everything that we have. And so the, the, tonight the heart of this is that everybody in here, you'll leave, I'm going to run my race. Amen. I'm going to finish strong when I stand before him and I look in my eyeball to eyeball and I'm standing there. He's going to be pleased with my life. This is, what, this is what drives us. This is what's propelling us is to do everything that he asked us to do in full obedience. Amen? Amen. So run to win. And then just the last part of that, they do it to win a prize that will fade away, but we do it for an eternal prize. So this is why we're calling this, we're on assignment for eternity, because what we do <laughs> is for an eternal purpose. Amen. 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 All right, did you have anything so to add? What we do is we bring the kingdom of heaven on the earth. I thought it was really interesting that all the things that Jesus did, it's recorded that the disciples asked this one question, Lord, teach us to pray. How amazing. You know, he, he was doing creative miracles, you know, uh, multiplying the bread and the fish. But he said, they, they said, teach us to pray, Lord. How, how do we pray? And so um, this is how we pray. Matthew 6, 9 through 13. It says, this then is how you should pray. Our Father in heaven, holy is your name. Your kingdom come. Your will be done on earth as it is in heaven. And so I want you to think about that. Jesus said to pray that the kingdom would come and that the will of God would be done on earth as it is in heaven. And in Luke, it tells us that the kingdom of God is on the inside of us. And so wherever we go, we're carrying the kingdom of God. And so we're supposed to affect, affect everywhere we go with God's will. And so God's will is his word. And so we see Jesus, you know, why did he come? Well, what was his purpose? We know that he came to do good. He came to destroy the works of the devil. He came to seek and to save. He came to give his life as a ransom for many. He came to show us the character of our Father. He said, if you've seen me, you've seen the Father. Amen. Then, one of the most important things that he did was to redeem us, to bring us into right standing. 
and then how to show, he showed us, he, he gave us an example how to walk and how to dominate and how to use the authority of heaven on the earth. Amen. He showed us how to live and how to operate as sons and daughters of the most high God. And so as ambassadors, as sent ones, I want you all to think of yourselves as a sent one, sent across the street to your neighbors, sent across the, you know, to the, um, to the bank, to the grocery store. I want you to think that you are sent to bring the kingdom of heaven, to do the will of God. And so when we see Jesus' purpose here, you know, we, we didn't go to the cross, but we do have to pick up our cross. Yeah. We yeah. do have to do the will of God and the purpose for our lives. But we do what Jesus did. We are his disciples. And let me read you something. Um, you know, we like Greek around here. Um, so the word for disciple is methetes. Um, it's a Greek meaning. It means it's a disciple. Anyone that would completely follow the master wholeheartedly. Anyone who would be described as having a total attachment to someone. The term disciple is stronger than just a teacher-student relationship. It goes far beyond. It goes beyond mentorship. The student, that's us, we're, we always want to be learners. Amen. We're, we're still attaining. We're always going to be attaining. We're going to be learning for eternity. <laughs> As God makes a turn, every facet of him is going to take us eternity to gather what we're seeing of him. So we're learners. So we must be committed not just to learn of the teacher, but to adopt the teachings of the master as our only way of life. In this way, a disciple is devoted, committed, and submitted to their master by giving up everything, denying their own desires, their own comforts, and holding nothing back in order to learn of him. The relationship is more than just acquiring knowledge. You know, this, this is about relationship. This is about revelation of who he is, and that gives us revelation of who we are. This relationship is an intimate training. This is necessary for our divine purpose. So we must identify with Christ. We must connect with him, and we do that by being in his word, by learning of him, by praying, by fellowshipping with the Holy Spirit, by um, coming close, inclining our ear to his sayings, and then we, we know what path we are to be on because that light starts to shine for us. And then our feet will lead us. And it says, how beautiful are the feet that carry the good news. But it's not just the one that is going, but the one that is sending the beautiful feet. They have beautiful feet too. Okay. <laughs> well, talking about being his disciple, I've got in here, but... um. With, there's, a, uh, there's a word here that's a Hebrew word, and it's a familiar word, and, and, and she actually taught me this word a couple of years ago. But the Hebrew word is hanini. I don't know if anybody's ever heard that. But um, it's hanini, but it's basically where you see in the word, here I am. We all know Isaiah chapter 6, where the Lord's like, who will go for me? And he's like, here I am, send me. So that's that word, hanini. And what that word means is, it's not a casual, you know, like, hey, where are you at? Here I am right here. It's a meaning of total availability, coming into divine alignment without even knowing what you're going to be asked to do yet. It's what you see when, when at the burning bush with Moses, when God called out to him, he said, Hanini, or here I am. It's what Abraham, when the Lord asked him to, to go and sacrifice Isaac, when he called him, he said, here I am, meaning I'm, I'm willing to do whatever you tell me to do without even knowing what you're going to ask me yet. I'm willing to do it. I'm coming into alignment with you, with your plan, with your will. Whatever you ask me, when you ask me, it's I'm going to do it. Yes, sir. I'm submitting my will to your will. That's what it means. And that's what we see coming into alignment. And so we see in the, the Gospels how Jesus said to really find your life, you've got to be willing to lose it. Right? You've got to be willing to lay your life down, lay your way down to pick up his way. And with that, you know, we're no longer our own. Right. <laughs> We've been bought with a price. And that was the precious blood of Jesus. And now he's Lord, he's master. Yes. And we're his servants. Yes. Mm -hmm. And so with that, the question I have, 
with being that disciple, with what we're talking about, with, you know, finding that your place, our place in his great commission, in his assignment for our individual lives. If he comes to you and, he's, and he asks you to do something, are you really available? Are we really available when he comes and says, Hey, Annie, <laughs> I need you to do this. Are we really available? We say we are, but have we really checked our heart? Have we really dug down to see, is there comforts I'm holding on to? <laughs> is there complacency? Is there fear? Is there the fear of not having enough money? Whatever it might be, are we really available? So I just want you to think about that for a minute. So are we really available to be fully, to say, Hanini, here I am. I'm coming into total divine uh, obedience mm -hmm. to your will and what you have for me. Amen. So ponder that. <laughs> <laughs> but um, do you have something we can go on? Or? Uh, I've got a little bit of Greek. Go ahead. So you're going to get some Rick Renner, okay? <laughs> He's not here, but you're going to get some Rick Renner, okay? <laughs> you know? Um, but uh, so with that, though, with with being available with our assignment, I mean, it's got to become, you know, a part of us. And looking at Jesus, Jesus is a uh, I want to show you a scripture that really shows his attitude towards what he was sent here to do, his assignment, his the plan that God had for him. And so it's a familiar scripture. You've heard it. We don't hear it a lot. But in John chapter nine, verse four, it gives us some insight. Um, Jesus said this. He said, I must work the works of him that sent me while it is day. The night cometh when no man can work. And so this scripture is incredibly important. And it should be a strong, we're going to look at the Greek. It should be a strong admonition for us as believers. It should be something, as we look at this and we see what Jesus' attitude towards his assignment was, we've got to take the same approach, the same attitude towards what our unique individual assignment is on this earth. Okay? So this is what it is. So Jesus said, I must. So here comes the Greek. Are you ready? Okay. So he said, I must. So that word must, in Greek, it means it's an obligation or a necessity. There's no options. Amen? In other words, it was imperative that he used his time wisely. Okay? I must work the works. Works. What does that mean? It's the work that completely consumes one's thoughts, our attitudes, and our actions. We give ourselves completely to the assignment. That's where it's all you think about. It's, it's who you are. It's, you know, of course, Jesus is number one. He's who you are. But, but you know, with that, with him... What he's called you to do, what he's put in your heart, that thing on the inside of you that nothing else can fulfill, that, that desire, that hunger on the inside of, I just want to please him. I just want to obey him. I've got one shot at this on the earth. I've got one life here on the earth. And what I do for him here affects what I'll be doing for all of eternity. I've got one shot. There's no redos. There's no, there's no other redos. This is it. And so we've got to live fully submitted, fully, completely. I'm consumed with what God wants me to do. I'm consumed with obeying him. I'm consumed that when I leave this earth, I'm going to stand before him and he's going to say, well done, good and faithful servant. Enter into the joy of the Lord. Because you were faithful in the small things that was here on the earth, now I'm going to make you in charge of greater responsibilities that you'll be doing for all of eternity. Amen. Amen? So coming into complete, uh, 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 completely surrendered to it. Okay? I must work the works of him that sent me. And so Jesus understood that he was sent and that his specific assignment for that mission, the mission to come and redeem us, to bring us back into fellowship with the Father. He knew he was sent for the mission and that he would, he would stand before the Lord and he would answer to the one who sent him. And so we're on assignment. We're sent. We're ambassadors, as Annie said. We're, right, we're ministers of reconciliation. We're ambassadors. We're citizens of heaven. We're on assignment. And whatever 
We're all part of the global assignment, the Great Commission, the church's commission, what we've been assigned. But in that, though, we've got our individual things that when we do our part, then the mission gets accomplished. Amen. But in that individual assignment, whatever God is asking us individually to do, there's no time for excuses. (laughs) There's no, no fear, no complacency. It's time to just do it. It's time to let it consume us. Let it be what we live for. I'm living to stand before him. I'm living that when I stand before him, my life mattered. The life that he gave us on this earth, that, we, that he's, he gave us his all. He gave us everything. He gave us his one and only son. And Jesus, he willingly went to the cross. He willingly laid down his life for us. And he bought us with his blood. Amen. So we're his now. Amen. And so we give it back to him. Amen. And so, so with that, though, so he, he, we know we're going we're gonna to stand before the one who has sent us to carry this mission out. And then the last part. While it is day, he understood that he had a God-given opportunity, a time to accomplish the mission. The time is limited, and he did it with enthusiasm. He did it with, with, you know, looking unto the Lord. And so we've got to make sure the night's coming. (laughs) We're wrapping this thing up, right? And so with that, the Bible even talks about in Ephesians chapter 5 how to make the most of every opportunity for the days are evil. So we've got to live with that, that is, that is day. And especially where we're going, we're, we're, in our hearts, what we see is where we're going over to this unreached area. It's day. There's a, there's a, there's a period of time to do the work before he comes back in the clouds, before we are called up to meet him. And we want to take as many of those people with us, and you all will be a part of it. Amen. Amen. So as you were talking, I was thinking about Jesus. He accomplished his mission. It says that it was the joy set before him. He looked on to see the joy. You know, joy is a fruit of the spirit. And as we're fellowshipping with God and his word, it's spirit and it's life. It gives us those fruits to be able to accomplish. And it gives us that strength within us in our inner man to accomplish what God has for us. And, you know, the world out there is bitter. You know, we need to have fruits in our lives. The fruits of the Spirit in our lives is not just for us, but it's for our families, our closest neighbors, our spouses. It's for the people out there to be able to take something from our tree of life, have something to nourish their body so they can taste and see that God is good. We have to have something for them. And how do we get that fruit? Our roots need to be deeply grounded in God. We need to be taking, you know, his nourishment, his words, and it becomes a part of us. It's so engrafted in us that we see the joy. We don't see his burden as heavy, but it's light and easy. And so people need to know God. But how are they going to know him unless you show him? Just like Jesus said, I've come to show the Father. Everywhere you go, you're coming to show the Father. You're, you're, um, you got a table, a banquet set before these people. You've got good food, nourishment. You've got peace in your life that they can come and take. You know, you've got joy in your life when there is none. You know, people are so heavy. They're, they're depressed. You know, you have the answer. You have the name of Jesus. You've been given a name above every name. That name breaks chains. It breaks bonds. And you've been given the Holy Spirit to give you boldness to say that name to somebody. And so we need that. We need boldness. We not need to be afraid of the faces of men. You know, we need the fruits of the Spirit in our lives. And we've been given all of this equipment, but it's time for us to embrace it, to know who we are, to know what we have, and to know the role we've been given to embrace it and to go and to, to touch people. You know, Jesus was a people person. You know, we're so busy. You know, when the red lights are taking too long, we're just like, oh, my gosh. You know, we want everything really fast, and we don't want any hiccups in our day. But there are God hiccups. There are divine appointments. And we need to be sensitive to our divine appointments. You know, our pastors, they're amazing, but they can't touch certain people that you can. There are certain people that will never step into church that you can reach. 
And so that's the harvest. That's the harvest that Jesus placed in our hands. You know, he, he gave us that commission. So he's trusting us with his harvest. Just like Travis was talking about, I don't know if you got to it, the talents. Talk let's, about let's the talents. I'll talk about that. <laughs> well, we're kind of getting there. <laughs> but uh, so, it, I mean, it kind of goes along with, with what I've already said. You, you got the heart of it, okay? Um, so, but we have this scripture that Jesus gave us. It's, it's familiar, and he said it's the parable of the talents. And we use that a lot for finances, you know, because they gave them money and, and what they do with it. But I want you to look at that, the talents, as what's the giftings? What's the graces? What's the talents that God has put on the inside of us and you all to reach people, to steward? The Bible says we've got to be, a steward must be found faithful. Amen. So we've got to be a good steward. So the, the parable of the talents, let's just read it real quick. I'm not going to read all of it, okay? Just, just a couple verses. Um, and so uh, Matthew 25, just verses 14 and 15. For the kingdom of heaven is like a man traveling to a far country who he called his own servants and delivered his goods to them. And to one he gave five talents, to another two, to another one, and then each according to his own ability. Uh, I believe that's the ability that was working on the inside of them what they were using, and then immediately he went on a journey. So I want you to see this. He gave something to every one of them. Every one of us in this room, God has deposited things on the inside of us, a gift, a grace, a spiritual grace, and we're supposed to be good stewards of that grace. So he gave it to everyone. Each servant received something. And then, but he, each servant received something according to his ability, according to what he could currently handle. You know, the one who received five, if he'd have just received one, he would have probably been frustrated because he, you know, he can handle more. And then if the one who had one, what if he would have gotten five? It would have probably destroyed him. He couldn't have handled it, right? You know? And so, but he, he, he gave it according to their ability. But with the ability, he's given us the ability to maximize what's on the inside of us. The gifting on the inside of each and every one of us. He's given the ability for us to grow that, to maximize it, so that because he's all about producing fruit that remains, right? It's like the, the, the mustard seed, right? It grows up into that tree. It's small to begin with, but then it grows and it spreads out, right? The gift of God on the inside of us, it'll begin to spread out and it'll grow as we steward it. And so he gave, um, he gave them the, 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 the ability to maximize it. And then just verse uh, 19, you know what happened? The one who got five? He doubled it. The one who got the, the two, they doubled it. And the one who got the one did nothing with it, right? That's nobody in here, okay? <laughs> but, but you see, they steward what, what, what they were given. And then the Lord, verse 19, okay? It says, after a long time, the Lord of those servants came. The King James says he reckoned with them. But it also means he settled accounts. So this is a picture of of us standing before the judgment seat of Christ. He came back and he settled accounts with each of them. And he looked at them and he did a, it wasn't a just a shallow little inspection, hey, how did you do? No, he began to analyze. He began to dig deep. The books were open. You know, the Bible talks about the books. The books were open. Their life, what they had done, he analyzed it. He dug deep. He figured out what they had done. How had they handled what he, has, he had given them? And then they received the reward based on what they had done. And so with that, with everything we're talking about for our lives, let us, let us receive rewards. Let us handle these things that he's given us, the assignments, what he's asking us to do for him. And in it is the most joy you'll have when you are obeying him and you know you're obeying him. But with that... It is setting us up for the greater assignments for all of eternity. So seeing things from an eternal perspective, not just the now, but eternally, what am I going to be doing? Yeah. And, you know, whatever you decide to obey and do, you not only align yourself, but you align your, the, the future generations that come. As Jesus obeyed, he aligned us. And so think about that. You know, think about your, your future generations and you know, how you be an example and how you're sowing and how you will align them to be in God's will and to do his plan. Do you have something else? Go ahead. Okay. 
I'm going to, since we're talking about the judgment seat of Christ, I'm going to at least, I'm going to read it for you, okay? I'm going to read out of the Passion Translation. So, at the judgment seat of Christ. And so this message, our heart with this, is to inspire you to live everything for Him here on the earth. To go all out for Him. Because we only have one opportunity. And so with the judgment seat of Christ, it's where we stand before Him. <laughs> oh, it's going to be a great day. Praise God. We stand before our Lord, the one who gave us everything. And all we're going to give back to him is our obedience. That we obey him while we were here. But with that, it's where we're going to discover whether we have rewards for eternity or no rewards. And so everybody in here, we want rewards, correct? Okay, so that's, that's the heart, okay? But 2 Corinthians chapter 5, verse uh, 9 and 10, I'm just going to read it out of the Passion Translation. It says, We live a joyful confidence... Yet at the same time, we take delight in the thought of leaving our bodies behind to be at home with the Lord. Verse 9. It says, so whether we live or die, we make it our life's passion to live our lives pleasing to Him. For one day we will all be openly revealed before Christ on His throne so that each of us will be duly recompensed for our actions done in life, whether good or bad. Amen. And so just another scripture, we won't read it. It's over in 1 Corinthians chapter 3. It just talks about, you're familiar with it, it talks about there's no other foundation besides Jesus Christ. He's been laid, and now we're building on that foundation, and we're using either gold, precious stones, or we're using wood, sta- wood and, and, and straw and, and hay, right? And it talks about how the fire at the end, when we're standing before him, whether our works, the things that we did for him, were done from obedience, were done with the right motives, with the right heart. Did I do my best to walk in love? Did I use the finances God gave me to build his kingdom? Did I build my kingdom or did I build his kingdom? What was I living for? Was I living for me or was I living for him? And so that's where the fire will test it. And it will either last and remain or it will be burned down to nothing. <laughs> But we'll still, still be saved and enter, enter in. <laughs> still be saved, but one translation says you'll even go in smelling like smoke, okay? But um, I think it was Joe Morris one time. Yeah, Reverend Joe Morris, he talked about his dad, how his dad didn't serve God in his entire life. And then, like, right on his, death, right on his deathbed, he received Jesus. And he's like, I just saw him sliding into, sliding into heaven in a Speedo. You know? So it was like, that was like all he had, you know? So, but that doesn't have to be us. Amen. And so the heart of this with, with the commission, with our individual assignments, is that it's just my heart is for us to hear well done. Amen. Good and faithful servant, enter into the joy of the Lord. That we all stand before him with confidence, knowing we spend our life for him. We live for him. Amen. None of these, like the scripture says, like Paul said, none of these things move me. But I do what he asked me to do, to preach the gospel. Amen. Nothing. Let nothing move us off of what he's called us to do, what our course is, what the plan of God for our individual lives is. Don't let anything move us. And then when we get there, like you heard Pastor Mark say repeatedly all the time, we'll have crowns. Anybody want a crown? Multiple crowns. There's multiple crowns. (laughs) But at that worship service, to be able to lay our crowns at his feet, that, that, that represents our life. It represents our obedience. It represents what we gave of ourselves here for him. So yeah. just to piggyback off of that, um, you know, the great worship service, you know, God wants that all nations would come to the knowledge of him and to worship him. But currently there are missing worshipers, three million missing worshipers. And so it's going to take the whole church to do the Great Commission, to reach the whole harvest. And so whatever our parts are, if we're all working together as one body, one day when we get to that worship service, we're going to be beside someone maybe we've never seen before, never even met before, from some country far, far away, and they will say, thank you for doing your part. You didn't know it, but you participated and you did this for me, and now I'm here, and I have eternity with God. And so that's, that's our future. That's the future we have to look forward to, and that's the most important thing, to live every day eternity-minded and working together, just doing our part. And so, yeah. 
I, I just when you're talking, I thought about the, there's a, there's a scripture in Revelation chapter five that that talks about that. All, every tribe, every tongue it says you. Uh, Revelation chapter five, uh, verse nine. We're reading to it, and they sang a new song with these words: "You are worthy to take the scroll and break its seals and open it, open it, for you were slaughtered." And your blood has ransomed people for God from every tribe and language and people and nation. And you've caused them to become a kingdom of priests for our God. And they, and they will reign on the earth. And so he's looking every tribe, every tongue to come to a knowledge of the truth. Amen. Mm -hmm. So in the meantime, we can find out what our role is individually. We can be welcomers to the people who are coming to this country from other places and they haven't heard the gospel. We can find our place and we can help other people find their place 